Levels of analysis are a very important concept for understanding the way in which uh, academics in particular explain international events. However, they are one of the most difficult concepts for students to understand, along with the concept of collective security that we talked about during liberalism. So I want you to be aware of this and to understand that they are a difficult concept for students to master, uh, and I expect a lot of questions to be asked in class about this particular concept. Spend some time reading very carefully the material in your textbook about levels of analysis and ask for clarification and examples if necessary. All right. So you are forewarned that it is, again, a difficult topic or concept oftentimes for students to grasp. There are two major learning objectives that this class attempts to uh, impart upon you uh, dealing with the issue of levels of analysis. The first is to use the three levels of analysis that we will talk about here in just a moment to describe events in international relations and understand how the description of events changes depending on the level at which you are attempting to describe it. And the second thing is to explain how the different perspectives and levels of inter analysis interact to create ultimately the explanations that we have. So describing things is different than explaining them. Right? The description of events is gonna be relatively the same no matter what perspective you have, but the explanation is going to be different. So we'll understand what it means when you make an explanation using a perspective and a level of analysis. In the end, you get many different explanations, often either from the same perspective or from the same level of analysis, but they interact to create the multitude of competing explanations that we get in international relations. So the first question I wanted to address in this short mini lecture is, what are levels of analysis to begin with? What is it exactly that we're talking about? Well, the textbook definition of levels of analysis, which again is one that is not particularly useful, I think, for students, it confuses them, is simply the idea that it's the direction or level right, from which different causes of international change emerge. They're the location, the unit of analysis where we're looking to determine what's going on. Again, that is a very abstract idea and one that can be very difficult for students to grasp. So I wanna to try to help you to understand it by linking units of analysis to a domain of knowledge that most students should have by this point in time in their career. And that is the idea of cheating. Uh, academic misconduct is what we refer to it here at the University of Montana. Um, during this course, you will likely take an assignment that will ask you to you know, look at particular types of academic misconduct, particularly plagiarism, uh, and how to avoid it, what it is and how to avoid it. But you're all aware that it is you know, about cheating, that it's possible to cheat on exams. You know, students you know, try to maybe take advantage of the system. And in 2012, there was a major cheating scandal at Harvard University. Um, about 2% of the undergraduate uh, body, you know, total number of undergraduates in the class and at the university um, were caught in you know, potentially cheating on an exam, actually, in an introductory political science class. It was called Introduction to Congress. Um, there were four take-home exams in the class, and students took home, uh, you know, about half of the students uh, in the class uh, were you know, investigated and about another half of them were, you know, had such, you know, were, were caught basically cheating, collaborating on the final exam uh, and, you know, working together on the answers, which is clearly a violation of, you know, of, of Harvard's honor code, but also just of the basic standards of academics. You just don't work, collaborate, right? It's your own work. Um, this is by far the largest cheating scandal in Harvard's history. Um, it's you know, engendered a whole number of responses by Harvard, uh, investigations, and then there were leaks about the investigation, which themselves were investigated. Um, and you know, it, for you know, elite universities, it was a major, uh, major issue. Yale even issued uh, a um, recommendation to its faculty to not do take-home exams because uh, of the uh, you know, fear that they would be seen as too easy in which to cheat on. Right, because so many students have been caught cheating at Harvard. So the big question was what happened? Right? How did these students uh, end up you know, f reaching a point where they felt that cheating was an appropriate reaction or behavior for them to engage in? Uh, why was it so difficult to you know, catch, at least initially, and then um, you know, require a big investigation and, and then demonstrate to be quite widespread? Uh, within the class, not just a handful, but you know, basically they caught a couple of students, they did more investigation of those students and discovered, hey, this is much bigger than we thought. 
So what exactly happened? What, you know, why did students cheat? Why was it hard to, to catch? Uh, and you know, what's the explanation? Well, this is, so this enables us to look at a couple competing levels of analysis for the story. Uh, one version of the story is gonna focus on the individual students, nearly 200 Hartford undergraduates who were caught, right? Cheating or lying, uh, you know, collaborating on their, you know, basically plagiarizing on their final uh, take home essay. And this would look at maybe psychological motivations of the students that they were, you know, so desperate to get a good grade in this class because having a high, you know, GPA at Harvard is sort of the expectation uh, of their parents and of society and future employers that, you know, they saw an opportunity to cheat. It was relatively easy. Uh, and so they went ahead and did it. Um, there could be a classist sort of approach, you know, that says, well, you know, people that go to Harvard are mostly elites and they have this sense of entitlement and they think, well, we can get away with it because we're, you know, important, powerful people or the children of important and powerful people. And so, you know, there was a sort of expectation that, well, you know, no one's really going to take it, you know, cheating seriously because we're so important. Um, so there's a variety of potential things that you could focus on. But the idea ultimately is that the individuals made a conscious choice to cheat. Uh, and so, uh, you know, in doing so, they carry then the responsibility, right, of, of that action. There are, however, people who are concerned more with the question, not just of, okay, you know, people cheat, it happens. You know, you can, you know, try to understand why some people cheat and some don't. But what was particularly striking about this event was the sheer number of students that were cheating. Uh, in the single class, right? It wasn't an isolated incident of just a couple of students here and there. It was half the class, you know, almost 2% of the entire student, you know, sort of the under, undergraduate student body at Harvard. Harvard has a lot of graduate students. So the under, you know, undergraduate class is, is you know, relatively small in, in comparison to, say, here at the University of Montana. But um, the idea is, you know, maybe there's something specific about this course or the assignment um, that the students were given this take-home essay that made it easy for them to cheat. Right? This was, you know, the reason why Yale University, uh, you know, said, "Hey, don't do any take-home exams after this," because they felt that take-home exams might be particularly prone to uh, this kind of widespread cheating. You know, maybe it had something to do with the questions that the instructor asked that they were confusing. And so some people focus on the fact that the professor had, uh, after the exam had been you know, distributed to students, had clarified several of the questions based on questions that students had. And so perhaps the root of this collaboration among students that they got caught up in and, and became the cheating scandal was simply, you know, started by students saying, I don't get this question. Let's talk to our fellow students to get an answer, something that, you know, at least at the beginning might be relatively innocent. Um, so there's a lot of focus on the professor and the structure of the class. Uh, and in fact, the class ended up, uh, you know, being removed, uh, at least for the next semester, uh, spring 2013, from the course catalog, because, you know, from, from the course offerings, because uh, there was a sense that the class needed to be adapted, you know, in some way in order to prevent uh, what appeared to be a relatively easy, uh, you know, ability for students to cheat. So one version, right, says as a people, as a students, we just focus on then what would make them cheat. The second says, well, you know, there's something about the environment, the context that these students were in, something about this course that they shared that may have incentivized them to cheat. The third level of analysis, well, you know, this course might have contributed to it, but the reality is, is that, you know, maybe it had something to do with the entire university system as well. Um, that the university had created an environment in which students were expected uh, to, you know, perform very highly. And so as a consequence, you know, cheating was something that was incentivized, not intentionally, but again, you know, maybe the university wasn't doing enough to point out that inflation, that, that cheating was a problem. Um, Harvard uses something known as the honor code, which is a, you know, which is, can be a very strong mechanism for enforcing, uh, you know, academic, uh, proper academic conduct when students are caught. The standard of saying, you know, we think you did something wrong uh, is much lower. Uh, you know, sort of due process wise, but at the same time, it's also something that largely relies upon students reporting, uh, you know, enforcing themselves, um, you know, and, and, and essentially having, you know, being sufficiently honest to admit that they've done something wrong when they commit it. And so as a consequence, 
you know, it was something where it sounds like, well, cheating's been going on, everybody's been doing it for years, uh, and it was only a matter of time before, you know, something like this happened. Um, so the blame is placed on the university system, or not the system, but on, on the, the institutions, the mechanisms by which Harvard governs itself. So each of those, right, is potentially true in the sense that each of the explanations tells us something. In the end, the students ultimately, yeah, are responsible for their cheating, right? They did it, so they're responsible. The course was set up in a way that enabled them to do it. So clearly there's something about the course that perhaps we need to change in the future. Uh, and lastly, you know, those students and that course all were part of the university, the Harvard University. And so as a consequence, there were some big picture stuff that it's going on there as well. Depending on what you're trying to do, you know, how you're trying to prevent uh, cheating in the future at Harvard, you're going to focus on those different things, right? If you blame the students, then you don't, you know, the professor doesn't change, the faculty don't change a whole lot. If you blame the course, you know, they can scapegoat the person, but if you blame the university, then maybe you have to do some pretty significant uh, changes to the nature of the system. I mean, ultimately, this university is the one who admitted the students who were dishonest enough to cheat, right? So um, you can, you know, place different levels of culpability depending on the level of analysis. So the level of analysis is important. It tells you something about the story. Um, it helps you to understand it. Um, you know, again, all the levels of analysis are happening simultaneously, um, but it's just where you're focusing because um, people want to focus in different places. So we can extend this and, you know, look at levels of analysis more in the context of international relations. What are the major levels of analysis that we look at within this discipline? Um, there are basically four that your textbook goes into some detail about. The third is one that actually has sort of two different conceptions of like how it might work. Um, you know, and so in reality, there's basically maybe four or five different levels of analysis that will at times find themselves in class. Uh, you know, in your readings, we'll largely focus on the top three, the individual, the domestic, and then just the systemic in general. Um, but occasionally we'll want to distinguish between a structural or a process-oriented explanation. So let's go into some detail about these um, again so you sort of pay attention to them. The individual level of analysis should make absolute sense. For the most part, it's one people grasp pretty intuitively. They also, people also get a systemic pretty well as well. It's, it's that domestic that really confuses students. So I'll spend the most time talking about that here in a second. But the individual analysis basically says that international events are caused by the actions of specific people or perhaps a small group of people. So maybe it's, you know, the government, you know, the, the cabinet of a particular country, you know, the president and, and you know, the, the minister of defense. Um, however, the government sort of structured. So the causes are specific people, sort of a small group of people that are sort of in charge, perhaps, of a country. Um, so some potential explanations at the individual level might be, you know, an individual's lust for power. Right. And so, you know, this is the one of the realist explanations for World War II is that Hitler just wanted to dominate everybody. Hitler was an evil guy. Um, and, you know, he decided, I'm going to invade Poland. You know, I'm going to, uh, you know, you know, commit the Holocaust, order people to, to exterminate uh, the uh, Jewish population of Europe. So, you know, Hitler, it's all on Hitler's fault. Everybody's just reacting to Hitler and sort of this bad apple. Right. Um, so it's an individual context. Um, you know, you might also look more at an individual's role in the policymaking or diplomacy process and say, well, you know, the reason why uh, this conflict happened was because this person was a bad leader, you know, or wasn't a good communicator. Uh, World War I, for example, a lot of people place the blame on, on Kaiser Wilhelm II, uh, the Kaiser in Germany, who was not very good at communicating his intentions with other world leaders. And so he thought things were going really hunky-dory, that he was BFFs with the British and, and you know, various others. And it turns out that he wasn't, right? And so you could say, well, this person was a bad leader, you know, made some bad choices. Um, Nixon, uh, you know, was a very effective uh, diplomat uh, during his time, uh, you know, as president. Uh, he opened up U.S. relations with China uh, and, you know, uh, did a, lay the groundwork for a lot of very significant uh, shifts in U.S. foreign policy. Uh, so, you know, you could focus on say, well, Nixon and Kissinger, his, his, his national security advisor and, and later secretary of state, uh, you know, was driving our foreign policy in this time span and, and you know, was really responsible for a number of changes. 
Um, you might also look at a person's values and beliefs or ideology, their psychology, um, all sorts of sort of attributes, components, things of an individual that might help to understand why they behave the way they do. And then the interaction of those chief individuals being the chief explanation for what happened. Again, just like the students cheating, we're trying to understand what is about this individual student that made them want to cheat um, and ignore some of the bigger picture sort of items. The most confusing level analysis historically in, in my classes that I've found you know, for students is the domestic level of analysis. The idea here is that specific states Right, have characteristics, there's attributes, things that we would describe as the United States is a democracy, it has a large military, a large economy, uh, it is uh, you know, a country which uh, has a large geographic size, a major population, it's a country of immigrants, uh, it has a lot of different you know, cultural values, uh, you know, it's, it tends to be liberally oriented, liberal democracy. Um, so you look at these characteristics and you say, these are the things which make the United States behave the way it does. It's these internal characteristics that define uh, the United States that determine its behavior. So it's the nature of its domestic power politics. The United States is a country with two dominant political parties that alternate power back and forth, the Democrats and the Republicans. And so elections matter a whole lot in explaining, you know, policy potentially. Um, so, you know, oh, the Democrats just got elected and so they have this much power. Oh, wait a minute, the government's divided and so now things are more complicated because the Democrat, Democrat president has to listen to Congress, you know, vice versa. So domestic power matters. Um, domestic institutions matter. So is it a democracy, is it a dotocracy, who has power, who doesn't, federalism, all these things play a role in something. Then you also have a state's culture or their ideology. You know, some countries, you know, view it, you know, have a historical desire to spread, you know, their ideas around the world and some say, no, no, we're going to stay out of things. Um, you know, some countries are open and some are closed. Um, so their culture, their ideology, their religion, all of these things matter. Um, one of the things which, in the end, that confuses students um, perhaps the most of this is that when we talk about things at a domestic level of analysis, it can refer to a specific state, which isn't necessarily the most difficult thing to say. Well, you know, the United States behaves these ways because here are its internal characteristics. But you can also talk about states in the context sort of of aggregate categories. So you could say, well, democracies behave this way. And the explanation and driving force and it says, well, the reason these states are behaving the way they is they, the way they are is because they're democracies. So it's an internal characteristic that matters the most. So you can use generic languages like all democracies do this, right? That's a domestic level of analysis. Or you can say the United States does this because and then you list the domestic you know characteristics. So to anything that is a characteristic of a specific state or of a category of states uh, is a domestic level of analysis. And it's similar to the course explanation, right, that uh, you might have for the Harvard cheating scandal. says, so, well, what is it the attributes of this class? Like, the reason why the cheating scandal happened in this class was because the professor wrote confusing questions and uh, the uh, you know, class you know, and, and had structured the assignment as a take-home essay. So the characteristic of the class was that it assessed things using take-home essays that were poorly written. Now students have the opportunity to cheat. The third level analysis, the most expansive level of analysis, and is the systemic level analysis. And here the idea is that causes are specific to how the international system operates. Right? In other words, states or other individuals are just cogs in a big system, and the characteristics of that system are what drive the things that we see. And really you see two relationships, again, largely between states here. One of them is sort of a structural explanation that says, hey, you know, states exist in this system, they have a relationship to one another in this system, and the nature of that relationship, the structure of that relationship determines their outcomes. So powerful states behave one way, weaker states behave another. There's also a process explanation that says, well, actually it's their interactions that matter, right? So realists tend to focus largely on structure, but not entirely. Liberals and identity perspective tend to focus more on process, but again, not exclusively. 
Um, this is the most general level of explanation. Um, it's the one in which uh, you know people try to use largely to try to predict what's going to happen in the future. Um, you know, so they ask questions like, why does a war occur? Can we eliminate war? You know, uh, you know, entirely is war inevitable? That's the kind of big level question that we can ask at the systemic level. If you want to know why the United States is going to do something. You do that at the domestic level, or if you want to understand why a certain individual did something or is likely to do something, you look at the uh, individual level. But the broad systemic level is um, where you go uh, for the big picture sorts of questions. I'm going to briefly distinguish between structure and process, just again so that you're able to hopefully distinguish between the two. Um, a systemic structural explanation or cause is you know, when you're looking at a state's position relative to others. So the things that matter here are things like anarchy. Right? So if the system is anarchical and student states are just pursuing self-help, that's a structural explanation you're saying. The reason why they did that was because they had to with self-help, right? because it's anarchy. Um, so you're going to look at distribution of capabilities. So powerful states should behave differently than weaker states. Um, it'll look at geopolitics. So you know, some states are going to behave the way they do because of their location. Right? and the right relationship they have to their neighbors. You know, if you're a country that's in a strategically desirable place, you're gonna behave differently than if you're kind of off the beaten path, right? Um, they're gonna look at international institutions and sort of how the rules uh, and how those institutions work. So, you know, international institutions, again, from a liberal perspective, they change how, you know, disordered anarchy is. They're gonna look at the distribution of identities and say, well, you know, there's these identities out there and their structure could change, but the structure at any given point in time explains state's behavior, right? So they're, they're sort of given things that you just say, the international system has these attributes and therefore states are reacting to uh, those attributes. The process, systemic process uh, level of analysis really looks at the way in which states relate to each other over time. So this is more about the security dilemma. Like, well, the security dilemma exists, and at this point, this state is doing this, so this state's got to respond, so that's what's driving it. It's going to look at the politics of alliances and say, well, these, this alliance is really powerful, this alliance is really weak, and so, uh, or doesn't, you know, there's no alliance on the other side, uh, and so that's going to explain state behavior. It's going to look at diplomacy negotiation and how you know, well, that's working. Are these states talking, not talking with each other? Um, you know, I mean, it's not so much a specific state, but again, just in general, is there the ability of states to communicate and talk with one another, an avenue for peaceful resolution of conflict? And it's also going to look at the construction of identities. What is it that, you know, not just what these identities are, but what relationships are going on right now which are changing or shaping the nature of people's identity are these states becoming more conflictual towards one another or are they you know becoming uh, friendlier right what's what's the relationship that's happening so the reality here is is that you know levels of analysis are a confusing concept for students to master i don't really understand why they're difficult for students to master if i did i would probably much more focus on what uh, you know, students needed to do in order to grasp them. Um, but again, I want to warn you to be careful, to pay attention to the difference between the levels of analysis. And the important thing is to look at how you distinguish between something that's happening at, say, the individual level, something that's happening at the domestic level, and then something that's perhaps happening at more of a systemic level, whether it's process or structure. If you have any questions about levels of analysis, please ask. They do play an important role in some of your assignments, which will ask you to you know, focus on a specific level of analysis or to generate a wide number of explanations uh, you know, that are at different levels of analysis and different perspectives. Uh, and it's important to be able to clearly distinguish between uh, those different sort of categories. Again, they tend to overlap, um, but you know, the key thing is the actor that's involved and in sort of what's motivating them. What's the major explanation? Uh, and where that explanation or sort of cause comes from is going to tell you what kind of level of analysis you're looking at.